namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa and today we uh, would like I would like to talk to you a little bit about how we should be studying with a teacher in order to develop our meditation which is our ability to see clearly how everything works and what we're going to do to watch uh, this closely and uh, learn how to do it is we're going to take a look at a particular sutta which is the Majjhima Nikaya number 95 in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation it's called with Chanki and in this sutta in the front section there is a large dissertation about uh, Chanki who was a very wealthy uh, merchant who the other Brahmins came to and they said Chanki, you know, the Buddha is in your district and we think that you should ask him to come and see you. And so Chanki reviews the entire background. They, they reviewed the entire background of Chanki with Chanki and discussed why the Buddha should come to see him. And then Chanki reviewed the entire background of the Buddha, which was just as detailed as his was and explained why he and the other gentlemen should go and uh, they should see the Buddha, the Buddha uh, directly. And the big one was that Chanki said that the Blessed One is accomplished, he is fully enlightened, he is perfect in true knowledge and conduct, he is sublime, a knower, of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. He is a teacher of gods and humans. He is enlightened and he is blessed. Of course, these are the nine qualities of the Buddha. And at that point, Chanki and the other men, the other Brahmins, decided to go and, and visit the Buddha where he was staying. Um, at that time, he was staying in the Kosalan country with a large member of the Sanghas and eventually he got to the Brahmin village that was named Opasada and there he stayed in the God's Grove, the solitary grove to the north of Opasada and that is where this takes place. So in the beginning when they reach the uh, Blessed One, the uh, Brahmin Chanki, together with a large company, went to him, exchanged greetings with him, and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, uh, he sat down to one side. And on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated and finishing some amiable talk with some very senior Brahmins. But at the time, sitting in the temple, uh, in the assembly, was a Brahmin student named Kapal Kapathi Kapatika. This young, shaven head, 16-year-old, uh, he was a master of many of the Vedas, their vocabularies, their liturgies, phonology, and etymology, and the histories of the fifth, and skilled in this grammar, he was fully versed in natural philosophies and understood the marks of a great man. So while the senior Brahmins were conversing with the Blessed One, he often would break in and ask a question and interrupt their talk, which is never done. Young uh, uh, students never come in and uh, break right into the senior students or senior monks. It is simply not done, and he did this. Then the Blessed One rebuked the Brahmin student, uh, Ka uh, Kapatika, and let not the venerable one break in to interrupt 
the talk of these very senior men. While they are conversing, please let the Venerable One wait until the talk is finished. But then a Brahmin came to the Buddha and said, Master Gotama, please uh, do not rebuke this student. The student is a clansman who is very learned and he is, has a good delivery and he is wise and he is capable of taking part in this conversation with Master Gotama. So then the Blessed One thought, well, surely, since these Brahmins, they honor him in this way, the uh, Brahmin student must be accomplished in the scriptures, and I'll let him speak. And knowing with his own mind, the Buddha thought uh, that the Brahmin uh, turned his eye towards him and had a question. And so that Brahmin student thought, the recluse Gotama has turned towards me and he knows I want to ask a question. Suppose I ask a question and then he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in regards to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through the oral transmission and in the scriptural collections the Brahmins come to define a definite conclusion, only this is true and nothing else is wrong. What does Master Godama say about this? This is an interesting question. Let's see what happens. How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says this way, I know this, I see this, and only this is true. Anything else is wrong. No, Master Godama, there is not. How then? Among the Brahmins, is there even one single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, and only this is true. Anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama, there is not. How then, student, in the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formerly chanted and uttered and compiled, and the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat and the repeating and repeat what was spoken and the reciting of what was recited, all of the names of the prior Buddhas and teachers. How then did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, and only this is true, anything else is wrong? No, Master Gautama, they do not. So, it seems that among these Brahmins, there is not even a single Brahmin who says this way, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And among the Brahmins, there is not even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher, back to the seventh generation of teachers, who says the same. And the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, they do not say this either. Well, we know this. They do not say that. We do not say we see this. We know this. Only this is true. Anything else is wrong. Student, suppose there was a file of blind men and each one was in touch with the next and the first one does not see, and the middle one does not see, and the last one does not see. So too, student, in regard to their statement, these Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. What do you think, student? That being so, does not the faith of a Brahmins turn out to be groundless? Well, the Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gautama, but they honor it out of oral tradition. Think, student. First, you took your stand on faith. Now you speak of oral tradition. There are five things that may turn out in two different ways, here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reasoned cognition, and reflective acceptance of a view.
This is very important to understand. These five things may turn out in two different ways, right here, right now. Now something may be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it is factual, true, and unmistaken. And again, something may be fully approved, but it may be well cogitated, and it may be well reflected upon, and yet it could be empty, hollow, and false, but something else may not be well reflected upon, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Under these conditions, it is not proper for any wise man who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. So just assuming something is wrong, coming to that conclusion does not stand up here. But Master Godama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? Now comes the question. How does one preserve truth? We ask Master Gotama about the preservation of truth. If a person has faith, student, he preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus. But he does not co yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth, but as yet, there is no discovery of truth. Now, if a person approves of something, if he has received an oral tradition, or if he reaches a conclusion based on reasonable thought and cogitation, if he gains a reflectance of reflective acceptance of view, he preserves the truth when he says, my reflective acceptance of view is thus, or my reasoned cognitation is thus, or my oral tradition is thus, then he is preserving the truth. But he does not say only this is true, anything else is wrong. And in this way, there is a, pre a preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves the truth. And in this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of the truth. So just deciding that something is correct without figuring it out, without seeing it, is very different. And the student says, in that way, Master Gotama, there is the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves the truth. In that way, we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gotama, is there the discovery of truth? In what way does one discover truth? So now we have moved from the idea of preserving truth and how we decide something is true and say it's true and everything else is wrong. Now we have moved to the other question of in what way does one discover the truth? So for you and me, how can we discover the truth? Here, student, a monk may be living in dependence of a village or town, and then a householder or a householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of states. In regard to states based on greed, based on hate, and based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on greed, such that with his mind obsessed by these states and not knowing, he might say, I know something, but he does not realize it is his greed affecting him. And while not seeing, he might say, I see. And he might urge others to act in a way that would lead them to harm and suffering for a long time. And as he investigates him, he comes to know. There are no such states based on greed in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this venerable one 
are not those of one affected by greed. And the truth that this Venerable One teaches is profound. It is hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. It is subtle, subtle to be experienced by the wise, to be experienced by those who can see the origination, disappearance, the gratification, danger, and escape, who can be seen by those who understand how to practice the release from this greed. When he has investigated himself and has seen that he is purified from states of greed, he next investigates this person in regards to the states on hate. Are there in this venerable one any states based on hate? That the mind is obsessed in such a way and he might urge other one, others that in ways that would lead them to harm and suffering for a long time. He investigates him and comes to know that there is not anything that is in resembling hate in regard to his bodily behavior, his verbal behavior, or his mental behavior. And the Dhamma that the Venerable One teaches is profound and it is experienced by the wise and the Dhamma cannot be easily taught by one if they are affected by hate and so they believe that this one is not affected by hate. When he has investigated him and seen that he is purified from these bases of hate, he then investigates him in regards to states that are based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states that are based on delusion such that his mind is obsessed by those states? And he might urge others to act in a way where it would cause them harm and suffering for a long time. Remember we said that delusion is the false idea of mm, everything is mine and I take everything that happens very personally. So that if someone approaches me or speaks to me or does something, I would take it very personally and get upset. But as he investigates him, he sees there are no states based on delusion in this venerable one and the bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of him are not ones that are affected by delusion and he would not do anything that would affect anyone in the wrong way for a long time. The Dhamma is taught by this person but it cannot be taught by one that is affected by this delusion which is Atta view. So when he has investigated him and seen that he's purified states based on delusion, then he places faith in him. And he's filled with faith, so he visits him and pays respect to him. And this begins the pattern of teaching the things that we should be doing in order to learn from a teacher. We should not simply drop in once in a while with a teacher here and there, but should find a monk who is willing to work with us, who is willing to stick with us and help us through our understanding. But we need to check out the monk first in this way, with greed, hate, and delusion. After that time, we follow this path with him. He places his faith in him, and filled with faith, he visits him, and he pays respect to him. And having paid respect to him, he gives ear, when he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. When you listen to the Dhamma, you give full attention and you listen carefully and quietly. And having heard the Dhamma, his, he memorizes it and he examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. And when he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of those teachings. And when he has gained a reflective acceptance of those teachings, enthusiasm will spring up inside of him. Where enthusiasm has sprung up, he will apply his will. And having applied his will, he will scrutinize. And having scrutinized what he has learned, he will strive. Resolutely striving, he will realize with the body the ultimate truth and see. He will see it by penetrating it with wisdom. And this wisdom we keep speaking of in Buddhism is the observation of 
the cycle of dependent origination or human cognition. If you are watching this cycle happening, and we will talk about this in our next couple of talks, when you are watching this cycle happen, when you practice the right effort, you are beginning to understand how things actually do originate, how they pass away without you having anything to do with it personally. And you also begin to understand how it's dangerous if you get overly involved with what is happening to you and do not see it essentially as it is, but begin to see it unessentially. And when this happens, you begin to suffer greatly. In this way, student, there is the discovery of truth. And in this way, one discovers truth. And in this way, we describe the discovery of truth. But as yet, there is no final arrival at truth. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the discovery of truth. In that way, you discover the truth. In that way, you recognize the discovery of truth. But in what way is there the final arrival of truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gotama about the final arrival of truth. The final arrival at truth, student, it lies in the repetition, the development, the cultivation of those same things. And in this way, student, there is a final arrival at knowledge. And in this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way, we describe the final arrival at truth. Now, in that way, Master Gotama, there is the final arrival at truth. In that way, we finally arrive at truth. But in that way, we recognize the final arrival of truth. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for the final arrival of truth? We ask Master Gotama about the thing that is most helpful for the arrival to truth. Striving is most helpful for the arrival of truth, student. If one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. And that is why striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. The striving in this case is the remembering to recognize and to release and to relax tension and the tightness in your mind and in your body as you move quietly towards the total release and liberation. But what, Master Godama, is most helpful for striving? Scrutiny is most helpful for striving. If one does not scrutinize, then one will not strive. You have to have an interest in this practice, an interest in finding out the truth. Because one scrutinizes, one strives. And that is why scrutiny is most helpful. But what is most helpful for scrutiny? Application of will is most helpful for scrutiny. If one does not apply one's will, one will not scrutinize. But because one applies one will, one's will, one will scrutinize. And that is the application of will that is most helpful for scrutiny. And this is the six R's. Your application of will to keep these steps of right effort going. In English, we call them six R's. We call this the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. We recognize when the tension changes in our body and mind. We release it. We relax any leftover tension and tightness. We then return and re-smile to whatever we're doing in life or to our object of meditation if we are practicing meditation. And then we repeat the cycle as ever we are needing it. And what is most helpful for the application of will is zeal. That is the most helpful for the application of will. If one does not arouse the enthusiasm of zeal, one will not apply one's will. But because you arouse enthusiasm, 
One applies one's will and continues on practicing. We asked Master Gautama about the thing that helps most helpful for enthusiasm. A reflective acceptance of the teaching is the most helpful for this enthusiasm. If one does not gain a reflective acceptance of this teaching, then the enthusiasm will not spring up. And this is vitally important. The, if one does not reflect on the acceptance of the teachings, it will not compound within you and the confidence will not grow inside you. And it is very important this happens for you to make good progress with your meditation. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teachings? Examination of the meaning is most helpful for the reflective acceptance. This is where it's important to understand that we do not hide what we are experiencing in our practice, that we do discuss openly with people who are in a similar level to where we are, that this was systematically going on in the time of the Buddha with the monks as indicated within the text where people in the first jhana were talking to people in the first jhana and so forth in each level of the development and finding out that their experiences were similar and so they gained a lot more confidence. And what is the most helpful thing for examination? It is memorizing. Memorizing the teachings cannot be ever overestimated. You should do this by memorizing the pieces such things as the five aggregates, the three kinds of feeling, and the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And then slowly study these different uh, levels of the teaching, along with the precepts and the hindrances and other pieces in order to recognize how they all fit together. These are all the threads that make the, uh, the Dhamma cloth that we've been talking about and a single thread or a, a single few threads, uh, a few threads is not the entire cloth. So memorizing the teachings is most helpful for examining the meaning. And if one does not memorize the teaching, one will not examine its meaning. But because one memorizes a teaching, one examines its meaning. And what Master Gautama is most helpful for memorizing, it is hearing the Dhamma student. That is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. And if one doesn't hear the Dhamma, one will not memorize the teachings. But because one hears the Dhamma, that is what will help the most. And what supports this? Giving ear. Giving ear is the most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. Because if one gives ear totally and lets everything else go away from your mind, it will enter in and begin to move within you to help you support your meditation. And what helps the most to give ear? Paying respect. Paying respect is the most helpful thing to give ear. It is one, if one does not pay respect, one will not give ear. But because one pays respect, one gives ear. And when you develop the giving of ear, you are developing the beginner's mind. You let all other types of meditation leave completely. All other things you have learned when you listen to a Dhamma talk, no matter who is giving it, so that you can hear whether there is a preciseness, whether there is a connection, uh, a way of putting it together that makes sense to you, and then that is what you take hold of and work with. So paying respect helps the most to giving ear, and of course visiting is the most important thing so that you can give ear, because then if you visit, you come expecting to listen, and the Dhamma is shared with you. And what helps the visiting most of all is your faith. Faith is most helpful for visiting because if faith in a teacher does not arise, one will not visit him. But because faith in a teacher arises, one will visit him. And that is why faith is most helpful for visiting. We asked Master Gautam about the preservation of truth. We asked Master Gautam and he answered about the preservation of truth. We approve and accept that answer and we're satisfied. We asked him about the discovery of truth and we approved and accepted his answer on that. 
And we asked him about the final arrival of truth, and Master Gautama answered about the final arrival of truth. We approve and accept of the answer, and so we are satisfied. We asked Master Gautama about the thing most helpful for the final arrival of truth, and he answered about that thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth. We approved of and accepted that answer, and so we are satisfied. And whatever we asked Master Gautama about, that he has answered us, and we approved of and accepted the answer, and so we are satisfied. Formally, Master Gautama, we used to think, who are these bald-pated recluses and these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsmen's feet? That they would understand the Dhamma but Master Gotama has indeed inspired us with love for the recluses, confidence in these recluses, and reverence for these recluses. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge, for life. So the thing the Buddha really is teaching us in this sutta, there is a definite progression to the transcendence that occurs in the system. And there is a way of getting off of the wheel of samsara. This is a beautiful sutta, more and more interesting as it goes along and the subtleties of it all become clear. This is a marvelous, marvelous tacit of teaching. So what we'd like to do, I'd, I'd like to do for you in the next couple of talks, is talk to you a little bit about the basis for your um, meditation and how to set yourself up so that you can keep the meditation we are talking about. You can keep it going almost anywhere, anytime, with anything that you are doing. This is a, um, a very, very good uh, thing to do so that you can compress systematically. I'm glad you could join me, and I thank you for the opportunity of reading the Sutta for you. And I hope I see you again soon. Thank you.